Hello, hello. Uh, just doing a few checks with Restream. Uh, let me just get myself set up. So I think we're live on YouTube and Twitch. Just double checking. Twitch looks like it's up and running fine. YouTube too. There we go. So that's does that come into the overlay as well? Yep, there we go. Slightly slow on uh, YouTube. That's all okay. Right, so chat's been tested. Both streams are running. Move this window down there. Uh, volume looks fine. Cool. Right. Uh, plan today is to continue where we left off yesterday. Um, we were trying to figure out how to add in some player controls into our scenes. Um, because I think it wasn't really covered in the Unity tutorial. Uh, the basic one. So what we've done... Actually, I can let me just swap over uh, onto this scene. Here we go. Right. Uh, so we were running through the uh, Unity Essentials pathway, um, and we've completed every section in this. Uh, there's a little bit at the end, which is about um, how you apply for careers and stuff that are linked to Unity. Um, that we've we've kind of paused for the moment uh, because I'm not really interested in that at the moment. Um, but it was all about uh, where to look for jobs and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's going to be on hold. But uh, yeah, so the creative community and your learning plan. Um, but we were trying to look for some way to use the new player controls because there's there's like a legacy player controller in Unity that uh, didn't seem too difficult to lock into. But I think with the legacy one, for each platform you're trying to use and each uh, controller type, you have to rebind all the keys and stuff like that. So if I wanted to make a game that's got uh, that can be played on mobile and on keyboard mouse and on controller, I'd have to have a section of code for each of those. Um, whereas it looks like the newer uh, control, bring this mic a little bit closer, uh, the newer controller manager or the input manager um, looks like it does all of that for you. Uh, which I'm hoping is the case. So I had a little look on YouTube and I found this channel called Code Monkey, um, who has a tutorial from last August about using the new input system package. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to try and work through this tutorial, see how that goes, um, see if it's any good. I had a quick look at some of the chapters and it seems like it's pretty decent. Um, and then we have, after that, we're going to look at the 
an endless runner tutorial, uh, which Practical Programming has uh, created. And it's got six parts to create quite simple um, endless runner, which is uh, the foundation of the first game that I want to try as like my first project. So this will give me the basis to start building on top of. Um, it's going to use a lot of the methods that we see in this tutorial, uh, but obviously I'm going to try and put my own spin on it and my own input into everything. So that's that's the plan for today. Don't know how far through that we're going to get, but we've got uh, quite a while. Um, planning to stream until about six. So uh, what's that? Three and a half, just over three and a half hours. Um, so yeah, see how this goes. Um, what I might do, I wonder if I can do like a picture in picture, which might be an easier way to do this. Uh, as we follow along. Let's have a little look at what it's going to look like in OBS. We add a window capture. And call this real window. Oh, that's on the wrong scene. Sorry. One second. We're on this one. We hit it. Adding our scene. No, not adding a scene. Adding a window capture. Tutorial window. And we want it to be this frame. Okay, and then if we put that in the top corner there, we might be able to move this onto the other screen. And what we'll do is we'll put that here for the moment. Let's just see. That should be okay, I think. Um, might have to cut it down a little bit so it's a bit more in view. Um, I wonder if we do that instead. Yeah, that's better. We can show you what channel it is as well. We'll boost it up there. We can get rid of the top and bottom. Okay, uh, let's give this a go. Um, now that's going to be a bit small, isn't it? We want to have the captions on. And we do need to capture the audio, I think, as well. This one. Right, and I think we need to dip the audio quite a bit. Um, I tend to watch things on double speed, so <laughs> sorry if that's the if it's a bit fast or if it goes through too quick. But uh, if you're interested in following along in the tutorial, um, the YouTube channel is called Code Monkey, and this is how to use new input system package. 
for Cut Monkey, and here let's learn how to use the new input system. This video is pretty big, but it's the only video you need in order to learn how to use the new input system. This is an excellent package that makes managing multiple inputs of different types is very easy. It looks a bit daunting at first, but once you understand how it works, it becomes actually quite easy to work with. And of course, the benefits of this system are immense. Once you have everything set up and your game working with the actions that you define, after that's done, then your game is instantly playable with mouse and keyboard, or that's input, or the music for a second as well. All that works seamlessly. Also, this video is a lecture taken from my Ultimate Unity overview course. Unity is massive, so in the course I explain over 40 features and tools of the engine that you might not know about. There's individual lectures explaining tons of things like shader graph, assembly definitions, pro builder, the video player, and so on. Also, the course will be continuously updated with free updates as I add more lectures explaining more tools and features. This specific lecture was added as a part of the first free update, along with 10 other new lectures. So go ahead, get the full course, and learn how to master all the Unity yeah, tools. So they got a full Unity course if anyone's interested in that as well. Package. This is a lot more capable than the legacy input manager, and it easily allows you to handle input from multiple sources without any issues. So you can make your games work with a mouse and keyboard, or an Xbox gamepad, or a PlayStation controller, and all of it works seamlessly. But naturally, all those awesome features come at the cost of slightly more complexity. However, once you understand how it's all set up, what is an action, what is an input, and so on, once you understand the basics of the system, it's actually quite simple to use. Okay, so let's learn how it works. First up, we need to install it by going into the package manager. Make sure you're on the. All right, now I can slow it down a little bit. Uh, let's go down to one and a half at the moment. Right, so what we're doing is we're going to start a new. Let's start a new project. A uh, new 3D project. And this is going to be input controls. Uh, let's do all one word, just in case. Um, and that's going to have to build a second. I'll put the music back on. Right, so we're going to be going to the package manager and making sure that we add in the uh, input controls, input system package. I think if we drop in uh, a sphere and a plane for us to control the uh, sphere around, that'll be a good start. It built this uh built this project first. Sorry about the delay. I mean I suppose it's part of the experience of uh learning Unity. Here we go. Right, um, so just to match up with what we've got over here, uh, we're going to put in uh, maybe terrain? No, plane. Let's put in a plane. And we'll stretch this quite far. No, not wide. Right, third. See this for the moment. Uh, can we give it? Right, how do we? Can we change this? So I clicked on something here and it all turned blue a second ago, so but there's there's no real option there is there. I would like something that's just not pure white, that's all. That'll be easier to see. Um so what we might need to do is bring in uh some assets for that. So let's just put our sphere on and 
we will set. Oh. Right, so that's fair. And we'll reset position. The plane is at zero, so if our spit if our sphere is one meter tall, we put the center at half. It should be just resting on our plane, which it looks like we are. Cool. Okay, what we'll do is... Oh, we have a favorite holder. That might be useful to put some stuff in there. Uh, let's open up the package manager. And we'll have a look at... Let's have a look at assets first. And we'll try and bring in something for um, some materials here. ground materials that might be what we want and if we can select like some of them can we preview uh, yes you can preview right let's add uh, let's add the grass and rocks for the floor Can I just do that? Yeah, okay. Right, we want this one, wasn't it? Yeah, let's do grass and rocks for the floor. Yeah, I think being selective on what materials and uh, assets you bring in is really going to speed up the process. And then what do we want for? Let's give the ball a metal. Just so it's a bit easier to see what's happening. Because a white ball on a white plane is probably going to get a bit lost. Hmm. I don't know how, but somehow I've got my phone controlling my Spotify audio. But it's not connected at all. It's not on the Bluetooth. It's getting it through the Wi-Fi somehow. <laughs> Can I stop this? Okay, there we go. That looks like it's uncoupled. Right, um, let's turn all of these off and we just want some kind of generic ball. Let's go for this one. All right, we have our two materials here. So on our sphere, that was if we not load it all in properly. Let's have a look. No. That didn't load in. Let's try that again. Right. We don't want the demo. We don't want materials. We just want this one, right? Did we stop it before it finished? 
importing maybe. Mm, doesn't look like it. We'll try again. Maybe we don't have the right file on here. Ah, uh, that's probably it. So are we number 16? Maybe here? Yep. So let's import these as well. Okay, maybe. Yeah, there we go. That's it. It, it didn't have the textures that it needs to pattern across the ball. Okay, and then on the ground here, we want our other grass and rock texture. Let that load in, maybe? Or is that loaded and it should stretch too far? I think that might be loaded, but stretched, right? And we did see how to do this on a previous tutorial. Um, which is the tiling, right? Uh, this is one and one. Yeah, see, let's get there. We want to shrink this. So we go smaller, 0.5 and 0.5. Is that the right direction? No, that's that's more zoomed in. Okay, so we want to go up. So, 100. Because we're, we're 100 by 100. Okay, that's a bit better. I wonder if you can randomize the orientation. Not entirely sure with that. If it's if it's ten and ten, does that look weird? Mm. It's not too bad, and then it's not so obviously tiled because you have a bit further to go. It's a little bit stretched though, isn't it? So somewhere in between that. Let's go fifty-fifty. Yeah, that, that's better. It's good enough quality. And it you can't see the edges of the tile so clearly. That'll do. Right, we, 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 we have our base soon. 40 minutes in almost. <laughs> um, okay, and then we wanted to bring in the Unity package for input. So this is the new input system. Yep. I just have to install that here. And we'll see how that's going. Okay, yeah, and then that has to change around some settings in the back end to use this. Because I think the default theme uses the old system. I think it relaunches, yep, yeah, okay. And then we'll go back to normal speed here so that we can follow along, hopefully. As this goes. So let's pause the music a second. The registry, then scroll down and find the input system package, and just go ahead and install it. And also over here, you've got a whole bunch of samples that you can download to inspect if you want to see how they all work. So these are some very specific scenarios, so maybe they can be helpful. Now, when you install, you might see a message talking about enabling the new input system or the old input manager. You've got two options. You can click on yes, which will disable the old input manager and enable the new input system, or you can click on no, so nothing changes.
Instead mm -hmm. of using that window, you can instead go into Edit and go down here into Project Settings. Then go on to the Player tab and then down right. here, scroll, expand the other settings. So we've got the input system installed and we're just saying the other option is to go into Project Settings and Player, which we've got selected already. Um, and then we're scrolling down to... Right, let's do that so I can actually see what's on the screen. Uh, just bump, bump back a little bit. Scroll down here until you see the active input handling. Uh, and over here you can select the old Okay, active input handling is what we're looking for. Active input handling. So we've got the new one selected. Okay. Cool. Good start. One, or you can select both of them. Now I cover the differences between both of them in another lecture, so go watch that if you haven't seen it yet. But essentially I find that they both have their use cases, so here I just pick both. And when you change this, it restarts the Unity editor. Okay, now to start actually using the new input system, the first thing you need is to create an input actions asset. This is an actual asset in your project files. So okay. you just right click on some folder, go into create, and then scroll down here until you find the input actions. So create it, give it a name like player input actions, and then double click on it. So when you do, out pops out the input action uh, window. Now this is where you're going to define all of the actions and inputs that you can then use in your game. Right, let's so jump back a second. <laughs> double click on it. So when you do, out, and then scroll down here until you find the input action. Input actions should be, in create, input actions somewhere here. Oh, there we go, right at the bottom. So create it, give it a name like player input actions, player. and then double click on it. So when you do, out pops out the input oh. actions window. Think we wanna now, this is where you're going to define all of the actions this. and inputs that you can then use in your game. So you see this separated in three groups. You've got action maps, actions, and properties. Right. Now let's add an action map by clicking over here on the plus icon. Yep. So an action map is how you organize various actions. For example, if you had a game where you have a player that can walk around the world, but also enter vehicles, you would make one action map for the player walking, another one for the vehicle inputs, maybe yet another one for the UI for while the game is paused, and so on. So using multiple action maps really helps keep things nice and organized by having distinct action maps instead of just a huge list of actions. So let's call this one just the normal player. Next up are the individual actions. So this is what actions okay. your game can take, like for example, move or shoot. So for example, let's name this simple action, just jump. Then over here on the properties, you can see the action type. So it's a drop down menu. You can select from value button and pass through. Now value is for continuous inputs. So something like movement being controlled by a joystick would be a value type. Mm -hmm. Button is like the name implies for things that work like buttons. So something where you press and release. Then pass through is similar to value, but it bypasses something called disambiguation, which is the process through which the input system decides which input is active. But for now, don't worry about that. Let's just focus on value and button. Okay, so now, if we jump, we're gonna want so let's button. Make it a button. Yep. Then we have interactions. This is the various ways that we can interact with an action of this type. So for a button, you've got the hold, multi-tap, press, and so on. If you just want a basic button press, then you don't need to add anything. That's the default. And finally, okay. processors. So this is how you can apply some processing to this specific action itself. This is more useful for when dealing with joystick inputs, for having a dead zone, and so on. But we'll see that in a bit. Okay, so when you create that a little bit. Action, it also creates a new binding. If it didn't, you can just right click and add a binding. All right, so there should be a binding there. Yep. I think what we can do is said if presses presses only necessary when you want to customize the press behavior. Uh, the default press behavior. So, like I said, it's the default button behavior is just press. Now. I imagine in here as well, if you have a jump button where you hold for a higher jump or you tap it for a smaller jump, this would be where we'd add it in. And I, can we do multi in here? Okay, let's just stick with the default for the moment. 
Um, but that's going to be something I'm going to have a little look at in a second. So the binding, this is the actual physical input that we want to tie into this action. Then for selecting the physical input, you can click on this drop down menu and manually select it. So go into the gamepad and over here you see all of the various buttons that you can map. Alternatively, for more advanced use case, you can turn this into a text box and over here type in the actual button. This is a special syntax used by the input system. So again, for now, don't worry about that. Let's keep things simple. And the simplest of all is just to click on this button that's named listen. So when you click, now you can press any key you want. So in my case, oh, wow. now, let's press the space bar. That's cool, right. Uh, just want to quickly check that the YouTube audio is on the right level. So I'm just going to go back a second. Just for capture. Second. Action, it also creates a new binding. If it didn't, you can just right click and add a binding. So the binding, this is the actual physical input that we want to tie into this action. Yep, then that sounds good. The physical input, you can click on this drop down menu. Right, so we're going to go to so path, and, over here you see all and then we listen, and we press space. Alternatively, for more advanced use case, you can turn this into a text box, and over here type in the actual button. This is a special syntax used by the input system. So again, for now, don't worry about that. Let's keep so for the simple. moment, we're looking into space. It's just to click on this button that's named listen. So when you click, now you can press any key you want. So in my case, for the jump, let's press the space bar. And there you go. That one listens to the space bar on the keyboard and just select it. All right. So with that, but we we've have got a full list of options here. Done. We made the player action map. Inside, we defined a jump action. We made it so that it works like a button, and we bound that action to the physical spacebar input. Now let's see how to actually use this to jump an object. And also one very important thing that you cannot forget is to actually save this asset. So up here you've got a button for save asset, and up here on the let's panel have for this window, auto save on. little asterisk. This means that there are unsaved changes. So when you see that, make sure you save it. Mm. And also up here on the right side, you have a toggle where you can enable to auto save. Do we want so auto save? Why this is the toggle not simply enabled all the time is because of the C sharp plus generation, which we're going to see in a bit. But until we do, you can turn this on and make things simple. Okay, so now that we have over okay, here, the our moment, we'll leave working, this turned on. In order to use them, the simplest way is with a pre built component. So I've got my testing scene here. I essentially just got a floor, and then I've got a basic sphere object. So I want to jump the sphere. And now over here, let's add a component and let's search for player input. So this is a built-in component that is really useful for working with the new this input one. system. Over here, you can see it takes an input action asset. So just drag the one that we created. There it is. Then we've got the default map. Right now, we just have one. So let's default to that one. Then we've got some more advanced use cases mm -hmm. for dealing with the UI, camera, and so on. So just leave these as none. And then you've got the behavior. So this is how the actual notifications of each action are sent. And over here, you've got various methods you can use. So first of all, you've got send messages, which uses the Unity send message system. So it triggers functions with these names on any script attached to this game object. Then the next one is broadcast messages. This one is similar to send message, except that it also triggers functions on any child object. But most of the time, you should use one of the other two. So either Unity events, which you may already be familiar with, or basic C Sharp events. So let's see the Unity events. Now here we get an events tab that we can expand to see all of the various events that this object will fire. Mm -hmm. So by default, we've got these three. So when it's triggered, when a device is lost, for example, a gamepad gets disconnected. Regain, so the gamepad gets connected again. Or controls change, so for example, you swap from the keyboard to the gamepad. So these are normally Unity events, so you can click on the plus icon, select an object and the function to trigger them. And then up here, you've got the player, so that's the specific action map that we created. And up here, we've got the jump. So this is the event that we made, the actual action. So this okay. is where we can trigger something. So let's make a script that we can then feed into here in order to have our event. So up here, I'm just going to make a basic C-sharp script. Call it testing input system. And here, let's attach it to this game object. Okay. Uh, and here, let's just make a very simple function. So let's make a public void jump. And on jump, let's... Just give and it a here, second let's there. It to this game object. Okay. How do we attach it? So up here, I'm just going to make a basic C# -sharp script. Call it testing input system. And here, let's attach it to this game object. Okay. So just clicked and dragged into here. Okay. Cool. 
And then we open this up. Now in here, let's just make a very simple function. So let's make a public void jump. Okay, so just delete the standard class here. We want public void jump. Ooh. And on jump, let's just do a debug.log jump. Okay, okay. it's very basic. And for the object, let's drag this game object as the object. And for the function, let's go down to the testing input system and the jump function. Okay, so like this, let's test. So here I am, and as I press the spacebar, yep, there you go, I've got the one. Yep. All right, that does one. work. Now let's just make the rigid body jump upwards. So just for right, and then and here. Let's just double check what you did there. Object and for the function, let's go down to the test. Let's just do a debug.log jump. Okay, just very basic. And for the object, let's drag this game object as the object. And for the function, let's go down to the testing input system. Wait, I missed that. Got to see what he's doing a little bit more. System and the jump function. Okay, hey. just very basic. And for the object, let's drag this game object. Okay, so in our player input events, player, our object is the sphere. So can I drag that into here? Yep. And for the function, jump. Okay. And then we play here with the console press space we see jump uh why are we seeing loads of it though did we i think we might have left the multiple windows running right in this player input here no it's triggering a lot isn't it Triggering three times for every press. Okay, so it looks like there is a press down. So, okay, it must be the three keyboard events. So, key down uh, and key up are both triggered. And then the actual press is triggered. So those are our three events that a key press does. Object as the object and for the function, let's go down to the testing input system and the jump function. Okay, so like this, let's test. So here I am and as I press the space bar, yep, there you go, I've got the log. All right, it does work. Now let's just make the rigid body jump upwards. So just for fun. Oh, it's sped off a little bit there. Let's uh, make sure we can follow along. So we want a private uh, rigid body. Why are we not getting the autofills? Do we have our extensions running here? Uh, should be some Unity snippets, yeah. Hmm. Let's see if there's a, a Unity IntelliSense. This is installed as well. Okay, no worries. We don't really need that. No, it's just useful to have. So we've got a sphere. Rigid body. Nope. What a. And then we want an awake class. Nice. 
Okay, so there is there is stuff set up here. And we're gonna put rigid body, get component rigid body. Add force vector three up, force mode, impulse. Okay, so just like times five F. I don't know what five F is there. Uh, okay, so sphere is get component, uh, which is the type rigid body, and in our jump function, we want to do our sphere rigid body dot add force. Uh, we're giving it a vector three dot up times by five f. Now I don't know what f stands for in this situation, but I hope the he's going to explain that. And then fourth mode impulse. This just and we'll say that. Support just to make the sphere jump. So here, and as I press the space bar, if there you go, the sphere jumps. All right, so far so good. Now, however, there's one interesting thing that you might notice, which is even though I press the space bar just once, over here we actually see three logs. Now, the reason for that has to do with the various phases that the input system goes through. So it's essentially one log for when the button was pressed, another one for the button is currently pressed, and finally for the yep. button release. Okay, that's what if we thought. If we expand the event, we can see that this event can be called with a parameter of type callback context. This is the type that contains more data on specifically how the button... Oh, uh, right. There's no rigid body attached to the sphere. Uh, because we haven't added the rigid body component to the sphere yet. Rigid. Oh, wait. As to is outside of testing mode, otherwise it doesn't save. So we add the rigid body here. Has gravity, that's fine. And now when we press play. And we jump. Nice. Okay, we have we have an input. <laughs> that wasn't too difficult. Button was pressed. So let's modify our function to also include this parameter. So back in our script, let's add using unity engine dot input system. And then we can modify this one. Now we're going to receive of type input action dot context. Then of course, if you want, you can just directly go to the definition and inspect all the source codes, all the various things that this one does. But over here, let's just see. Um. I mean, we're already using Unity Engine. Do we need to bring in this dot input system? Uh, so jump, we want the class testing system. One of behavior. Yep, that's right. Or jump that in here is putting input action. Oh. Dot that's context context now if we didn't have this then this would be an error but is this not just unity engine dot input action no it's not okay it's just different class in c sharp um, and then we're going to have to add the context somewhere, right? Phase. So let's add into the log the context.phase. And back in the editor, since we modify the function, let's assign it again. So once again, the context jump function. There you phase. go. So let's test. Okay. So here, and as I press the space bar, any of there you go, you can see the very modify the function. Let's assign it again. Uh, does. But over here, let's just see the actual phase. Is this so a function or is it a property, phase. isn't it? Yeah. And property. Okay. Uh, we do that, and then when we test in here, oh, we did this in play mode. Well, let's see. Uh, yeah, it's not liking that. Let's just double check that's all okay. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, 
And if we try this again, hopefully. No. What have we broken? Um, let's just double check what we've missed there. And, and it's back on see of type in parameter. So back in our script, let's add using Unity engine dot input system. Yep, got and that. And then we can modify this one. And we're going to receive of type input action dot callback context. Yep, got that. Then of course, if you want, you can just directly go to the definition and inspect all the source code, some of the various things that this one does. No, but over here, fine. let's just see the actual phase. So let's add into the log the context dot phase. And back in the editor, yep, since we that. modify the function, let's sign it again. So once again, oh, we have to sign function. it again. There you go. So let's test. Right. Okay. Uh, so we're in here. We've got you. We've got our player input action. And in the events, in the jump, player, jump. Missing text. Okay, that's why. Uh, where's our jump command? Here? Maybe. Let's see. So does it unbind each time you make a change to the code? Okay. Started, formed, cancelled. Nice. And we hold down space. We can see that it cancels way later. And... Oh, this is just an infinite double jump at the moment. Ah, and it's giving it a fourth based on the jump. So, can we zoom out? Uh, if we zoom our camera out a lot further, and where's our main camera? Oh, we want to be... Yeah, let's, let's do it here for the moment. Let's move our main camera to this view. Just to have a look. So if we spam space, we might be able to, like, go super high. <laughs> This additive force that we're doing at the moment. Oh, did it fall through the floor? Probably did, didn't it? Uh, right, zoom back in. We'll move our camera back to here. Actually, No, that's okay. Right. Nice. Okay, so here, and as I press the space bar, and if there you go, you can see the various stages it goes through. So the start, so that's as soon as I press, performed, so that's I'm currently pressing it, and cancelled, which is when I release. So these are the three separate stages that the input system goes through. So for example, for a button, chances are you really only want it to be triggered once when the button is pressed, so you can use the performed event. You can either test if the phase equals phase dot performed, or you can just go if context dot performed. So okay. this is a simple boolean that simply returns true if it is in the performed phase. So if on the performed, then you do this. Nice. Okay. So we're not in play mode. We'll go back into here. Uh, we'll add in our context here, and we want if context dot Oh, not context. Context dot performed. No, not cancelled. Uh, and that's our bool. We'll add this in here. And close it out. Right, so. Uh, we should see. What I want to do is we'll have a jump like this. So we get an initial small force. Hmm. Which way around is going to be better for this? Let's see. If we can do context, good. 
No, context. Dot cancelled. I want it to be when you let go, you get a negative impulse. Um, and then we don't want this here. Actually, let's just get rid of that all together. So now what should happen is when we press jump and hold it, we go up. And if we let go, we get a force back down. So now that we've changed it, do we need to remap it? Is the question. Is it every time we change it? Because that would be really annoying if that's the case. Player. No, context is still there, right? Let's play. So we hold it. Okay, so before we were getting 10 up because it was going on the started and on the performed. So let's change that to 10 up. Oh, no, we're live, aren't we? Does it allow us to do this live? Player input, event, player, yeah. So yeah, if we hold it down, we go up higher, but as soon as we let go, we get our force down. Kind of like the uh, like a Flappy Bird experience in terms of the gravity. <laughs> but yeah, it can really throw. <laughs> I can really throw you off because <laughs> if you hold it and then let go, you get a faster deceleration at the point where you start falling because obviously you're. Uh, your force upwards is approaching zero as you get to the top of the apex. So actually, if we do it on the way down, we get the additive extra five units of force, wherever the F stands for. Um, so we've got 10 going up, five coming back down. And if you time it at the apex, 10 has already been negated by gravity in the world. And you just get the five downwards. But if you do it straight away, you're still getting the five force up. Cool. That's quite interesting. Okay, uh, let's undo that though, because we don't really want that kind of control. Uh, we'll just leave it on the upward jump. Right, what I'm going to do, I'm going to drop the Spotify volume and just leave it on in the background. So we've got, right, can you even hear any of that? Something like that? It's not bad. I think that's better, yeah. jump and there you go it jumps much less because it's only being applied the force once and you can see that we just have one low all right awesome so that's one way to make it work by using our oh yeah i suppose before we were we were getting triggered three times and an upward force so let's see how this one works so any click these are c sharp events so they are not visible in here in the editor so the way you subscribe is like any other c sharp event so it's through code so first of all, let's get our component. So private, it's a type player input. Okay, so we get that one. And then through there, we can see all the various events that it has. So it's got the default ones that we saw a while ago. So on device loss, we gained and on controls changed. And then for the various... Just uh, pause that a second while we copy this. Okay, so in our awake, we have player input dot... No, equals get component. And the component type is 
player no player input and it's a function oh yeah get component obviously you're gonna be a function um, player input dot on and what are we gonna go for is actions you've got this one on action trigger so regardless of on how action many triggered actions you've got you've just got this event so as you might imagine the one big difference is that this one is triggered for all actions on all action maps now right now we just ah. have one action but if we had more then any action input would fire this one event so let's simply subscribe to this one and as you can see this one takes a parameter of type oh, plus context. equals so when we get the context let's just do a debug.log on the context just to see what this is doing okay so let's test okay so here i am and as i press the space bar and uh, you know, now i can see the various contexts you did player input underscore on action triggered which i didn't see where that's from Alright, I wasn't too long. I don't want to go about 10 seconds. Okay, I'm going to have to go about 10 seconds. Right, where is this player input on action triggers coming from? Player input on action triggered. Oh, sorry. He's created another. I didn't even look past that stage where he was. He's created another function called player input underscore on action triggered. And it's a, yeah, it's a function. Okay. And this is going to be a private and void because there's no uh, return from it. And in this function, we are taking in. An input of uh, input action dot callback context and here's our context again and then we're saying log uh, context context just to see what this is doing okay so let's test okay so we save this go back to unity let this reload the scripts. That should be okay. We run. And in the console, when we press space, the started time, perform time is the press, and the cancel is the dot. And this is because under jump we have our keyboard space option. Now, if we instead, uh, how do we go? We go to our input player object under jump. We we add another binding. Uh, binding, yeah. And if we do it as uh listen and then i've got an X xbox controller let me just plug that in and then we can monitor for a button press maybe maybe not maybe it has to be plugged in before we start you see or before we open the player input Hmm. Do we have to tell Unity that I've got a controller? Gamepad. Xbox. A. Okay, let's... I think this is not going to work because I think I've plugged in the controller after we started. Oh, there we go. Yeah, it's it's saying that 
under the jump command, we've either pressed keyboard space or uh, our Xbox input button south. And that's the only one that's key bound. So none of the other controllers inputs are working. Cool. Well, I'm going to leave that plugged in as well. Just so we've got some options to, to mess around with. Okay, so here I am, and as I press the space bar, and if there you go, now I can see the various contents. So I can see the action is in the action map player, it's the jump action, it was triggered by the keyboard space. Then for the phase, this one is the start. But we're not it triggering the jump here. 5.9 seconds, and once again the key, keyboard space, with a value of 1 so and no interaction. If we just so do jump here, phase, the phase, with our context. So in order to use this method, then you do some identification over here on the action field, and depending... Let's just try this, see if that's uh, the way we do it. Yeah, nice. And also our Xbox also works as a jump. Nice. So when the button's triggered, so yeah, you can do extra logic in here to say like, uh, if we don't want to do a jump in certain situations or we don't allow, actually, yeah, so I'm guessing if we do something like private, no, hmm, let's do a private vector three uh, as a player location. Maybe. And player location equals. Let's see what's in here. Get mm. maybe game objects. Hmm. How about sphere rigid body dot? Uh, yeah, here we go, dot position, right? Could be, yeah. Maybe. And here we do if uh, player location dot y equals zero. Uh, it doesn't need to be double equals. Triple equals. Double equals? Let's start with double equals, I think. Uh, I know JavaScript does double equals for uh, an equal value and triple equals for equal value and an equal type. Um, so that you have to specify triple equals. Well, it's good practice to do triple equals most of the time. So this should be... This should only allow us to jump when we are on the ground. Hopefully. Let's see. <laughs> Give it a try. Okay, so we press space. No, we need to rebind. Uh, Uh, no, because our position starts at 0 0.5 because the sphere is uh, a meter tall, right? And this is, position is based on, uh, right, this Y location. So we do 0 0.5 and let it remap. No. Um, so what we want to do is we want to do context and also player location Y and see what, uh, maybe let's do a plus, no, I feel like that would allow us to, nope, how do we do multiple things in the log? Well, we've done it here, we've got a plus. 
Maybe an ampersand. Double ampersand? No. Hmm. Why is it coming up? Oh, oh. So I understand the plus is going to try and add the two things together, right? It's not going to just do concatenation. But if I put a space in the middle, this this will uh, do it, right? Yeah, there we go, right. Right, now let's see what, what the value of y is and why it's not letting us jump. Jump cancelled. Not outputting anything. So, have I got a bug somewhere? Could be a function. Not a function. Hmm. Not sure. Let's have a little look. Actually, I wonder if there's help on this. Uh, yeah, position of uh, rigid body. Best way to get rigid body position. spell it right is apparently a lot better performance but I don't know if that's really helped us the player location but ah uh, no no we want this to be constantly updated right so we want this to happen when we're triggering. And then we want to see what our Y value is, right? Let's have a little look. What I don't like is that we're not getting our input in through a tool now. So let, let's undo this. Let's what's our input debugger do? Right, so it's seeing my space press there. That's seeing the A button pressed. And the other buttons on the keyboard, okay, and on the controller. Okay, and then we when we run it. Okay, uh, maybe I just had to stop and restart it. 
But we, what we shouldn't be able to do now is press jump again in midair. It only lets us jump again when we reach the ground. Nice. Okay, so that prevents double jump options. Or like multiple jumps in the air. And then what would we do if we wanted to... If we wanted to do a double jump, we could do a private ball called... Uh, let's just do... Double jump. Uh, double jump available. Okay, and then on a weight that is true. And then when we jump, we say double jump available equals not double jump available. So we're inverting the ball. So each time you jump, uh, in here, we want uh, if double jump available, we can jump. Um, and then it's not. Ah, no, wait, wait, wait. Wait, it's, uh, we want here. I'm assuming this is going to be an or situation. There we go, right. So you can jump either if player location is on the ground or double jump is available mm. I think we want these as two separate if statements actually so if y equals zero uh, or ground basically jump And then else, because we'll be in the air, if double jump available, then we can jump and we set jump to false. And we need the opening bracket there. Okay. And this only resets, actually, let's make this more explicit because this will always be false in this situation. And we set this back to true here. So when we're on the ground, we reset the ball to be able to double jump. I think. Who knows, let's give it a go. Right, I think we need to stop and restart. And we have our normal jump here. And then... Uh, hmm. Ah, right. We need to put in the same condition that we've got here. Because we only want this on the performed option, right? because this is still the same context of triggered and the triggered occurs three times. So we're automatically doing the double jump and then it's locked out. Right, so let's restart. I really need to remember to stop running the game section. Right, and there's our double jump and we can't jump again. Nice. <laughs> wow, okay. Um, we can see how things are going to start moving together.
Okay, let's have a little look. Hurry up to. I kind of want to just start playing around with this now, but let's see what else is in this tutorial because uh, there's probably going to be quite a lot of useful stuff here. <laughs> We're only 13 minutes in and we've already learned a load of stuff around. That's right. Than you do different things. But if we're going with this method of using this built in player input class, then I think it makes more sense to use Unity events for this one. So, again, you can use both, but here I'm going to switch back. So, just like this, and make sure that on the jump event it triggers the jump action. Okay, so now it's a good time to look into action interactions. So, back in our input manager. So, why why is it better to use this though? Uh, stop playing. Actually, what I want to quickly do is um, it looks like there's a way to set up the UI so that when you're in play mode, um, the whole UI is a different colour. Uh, so, I'm gonna guess that is gonna be in preferences, graphics tier, no, don't know what that is, might be preferences, yeah let's go in preferences, team view, GI cache, Outdoors. colors, Playmate tint, here we go, this is what we want, I think, let's just put this on for the moment, and see that is what we want, when we press, yeah, there we go, gonna be nice and clear when that's happening, uh, and why not, let's have a look at what our, what's our colour? Mm, I don't remember where that's set. It's somewhere in uh, Twitch. My channel brand, maybe? Here we go. Right, let's go with our Twitch colour. Or our YouTube colour as well. Which we are using this colour. When we run, nice. And it's very obvious when we're in uh, play mode. Okay, now we know all of that. Uh, he's gone back to invoke Unity events, and in our event, in our player events, we have our jump function. Now, maybe what we want actually is. So we're not using this now, right? No, we don't need all this space it's here. So this player input is this function here. I don't know why we're using plus equals here. on this property, right? We're adding to the property the function. Okay, so is this like a class? Uh, we're extending the class by giving it a method? I think that's what I'm understanding from that. 
Because I know that C++ is all built around classes. Classes and uh, methods and properties. So I'm guessing the same thing's happening here. Ah, cool. So we have a... This is just JSON, isn't it? Not plain text. Right, so these are... This is how the file interprets our player actions. So really, if we wanted to, we could probably uh, fill out the input details here. But what we're going to want to do is have all inputs completely customizable. I think that's the easiest way to do things. And then you map to the functions that the inputs are mapped to. Uh, so actually, in the programming side of things, you aren't looking for specific inputs at all. You're just looking for the input that means jump, etc. Which I think this is what it's doing. Hmm. Okay, we'll go with that for the moment. So at the moment then, if we go back to the other one, I wonder if we're just doing this jump instead. So we shouldn't be getting the Y location. We have our jump, we have it all signed up, so we press play, and if we jump, yeah, so we're not locked into the double jump here and again we can switch we can switch between controller and keyboard at the same time so pass the context into the jump function Now I wonder if we just copy this here, we put this in here, and instead of the jump contact, we're just looking at our actual jump function. Oh, I need I need something that unsaved does the uh, auto spacing for me. Cannot configure C sharp files. Maybe try that one. That looks okay. Uh, we want to drop, drop down to two spaces. We don't need that much space. Oh, you're not gonna, you're gonna be like that, are you? Uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna pull everything in all the way to the left, and then. Oh my document. No, why is it doing four spaces? Indent using tabs. Let's try that. Doesn't need to indent that far. Hmm. 
Let's see if that can do it the right way. No, okay, I'll have a look at that later. I don't think you've had to do that just yet. Okay, so hopefully we've got our double jump added back in here. Ah, but we're not getting our player location. We need still need the player location here. When we jump. And actually, we only care about getting it uh, when we're in here, right? No, not that one. This one. Hmm. I'm not sure if I like having the opening bracket on the second line. Is that how I normally do things? Let's see what my normal code does. Uh, now I've got to find out where my normal code is. Projects. And we've got some JavaScript. Yeah, I think it's normally on the same line. Uh, header. Nope. No. Yeah, it should be on the same line. Okay, that that's something I can configure with a prettier uh, spell check or something like this. I wonder if I can get prettier for D sharp. going to save a lot of time editing. Uh, prettier. Uh, VS Code as well. That's what I want. Okay, so we go here, we do file preferences settings. Yep. Uh, then click what? Then click to open settings JSON. Where is that? Oh, up here. There we go. Nice. Okay. And then editor default formatter C sharp on the top line somewhere here. Yeah, then, yeah, okay, we don't want that. We want. Oh, it's still the same. Don't know C sharp. Okay, we'll have a look at that another time. This will be good enough at the moment because I think it will still do the formatting. It's just a case of. I'd rather have the. Opening bracket be on the same. The opening, uh, what are these? Kelly brace? Kelly bracket? On the same line as the function. Just because I'm, I'm more used to that in. Oh, I need the C sharp extension. Which I have got this C sharp extension. No, okay. Ignore that for the moment. Let's go back to our tutorial. We're only uh, 13 minutes. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, we were testing the double jump though. So hopefully that 
we check the location only if we are pressing the jump button and if it's on the ground or if our double jump is available then we can jump again and actually what we can do is do something like have our initial jump be more forceful than our secondary jump So your double jump is just like a little bit on the end. Uh, so we play. So we, and there we go, can't jump again. We can jump twice early on to give us a massive boost because it's both of them additive straight away. Or we can delay our fall a little bit by doing a late jump. There could be really, you could do some really tight controls around this. Yeah, oh, why? Now we can't jump anymore. Did we not land on the floor correctly? I wonder, let me... I think we've got an issue here where our player location isn't exactly 0.5. Uh, I'm going to have to stop and restart. Hold on. Okay. So, yeah, 0.5 is fine there. 0.5 is fine there. So, not letting us do the, the jump. I think we got into a weird situation where it didn't actually land on the floor properly. Now I can only do that by trying to repeat the test. How did it, how did this break? It didn't break before. We were doing like some weird little jumps here like this. Maybe it wasn't broken. And uh I just wasn't pressing the key correctly. Which I'm not sure that's that could be the case. I think in reality. Uh, I wouldn't have it being equal to an exact value. You'd probably have to give it a range that you can jump within. Just to make sure that uh, slight offsets aren't going to be a huge issue. Okay. Um, right. We've got the jump action over there. It's an action type button. Okay. And we've got the interaction. So let's add one. Let's, for example, look at the hold interaction. Then if you want, you can set how long. So how much time do you have to hold the button before it's actually triggered as a hold event? So you can use the default. So just take this box or untick and set anything that you want. And like this message says, you can click over here to open the input settings. So this opens up the project settings and goes over here to the input system package. And you can then create a settings asset and modify all the defaults. So let's test just with the default. So just the hold. Once again, don't forget to save just in case you have auto save disabled. And back here, we are not using C Sharp event, so let's just clean up the code, just get rid of this so it's easier to understand. And over here on the jump, let's actually do a debug.log on the entire time. Right, what we want to do is we're going to leave this in here. Um, and we're just going to put a little message. I assume that's, yeah. Um, this code is for C Sharp events. Rather. Uh, Unity events in the what's it called behavior play input behavior uh, component play input component behavior property player input component behavior property Cool. 
So then what we can do is we can just comment it out rather than finding it. And we can just do that. And what we'll do is we'll also copy this on top of this one and also comment this one out. Uh, and also we don't need the player input anymore. So that is in this bit. And that one. Oh, it just gets rid of the references. That's why it moved up. Uh, and also, I don't think we needed this squid because this was the. No, we did need it. I don't think we need these two though. They're, it says they're not being used. Let's let's take them out for the moment. Let's just double check we're all still working. No, we're not still working. Right. Uh, we're using Unity events. We have our jump function. Is it because I took these out? What are we doing? We're getting that. We're setting that to zero. That's fine. And then. Should be working. So let's uh, reset because we changed that input slightly. There we go. No. Oh, uh, right. Because we changed our input to hold, you have to hold it now to do the jump. Right. So it's not hold and press. So if we go back to our player input here, and on our jump, we also add in press and hold, right? That's fine, that's fine. And that auto saves, right? And now when we do it, when it loads, console. So it's just a tap and just a tap or a hold. And we hold and then tap. That also works. Okay. Right. So we've got hold and tap options. Let's see what's next. Okay, so we have the whole interaction. Now let's see just how often this function will be called. So here I am, and if I just quickly press, yep, we can see we've got the started and the canceled phase, but we did not get the perform phase. That is because we did not hold on for long enough. Mm -hmm. And the sphere itself did not jump because it only jumps on the perform phase. So if I click and I hold, after half a second, then it does do the perform, and now as I let go, now it does the cancel. So as you can see, the interactions are super useful for making some more complex actions. And again, remember that everything that we're doing here, we're making it work with the keyboard, but if we add another binding, it would also work with the gamepad or touch or anything else. And also yep. this is a list, so you can have multiple interactions. So you could have a hold, and then a slow tap, and so on. Although ideally, chances are you would make them into separate actions. Okay, so that's the interactions, and then you've got the processors. Like I said, these aren't really very useful for buttons, but you can, for example, add an invert processor. And right now, before we hit play and clear the console, we can see Right, that. okay. So what we'd want to do for what we're trying to set up here is these player inputs, we would add a second action, which is our high jump, let's say. And how did we do this before? We want the same bindings. So we want space and 
We want another binding, and binding, and it's our A button. Or the south button on our controller, that would be even better. And we want this to be our hold interaction. And then this one doesn't have a hold. Yeah, okay. And then we save that. And then in here, we can copy this and then call this high jump. Uh, the rest of this is exactly the same, but our vector is going to be different. And this vector is different. Uh, let's do that. Let's make it massively different. So it's really obvious for us what's happening. And then if we go back into here, I think we might need to hook up the function separately. in our sphere player controls. So in our event player, high jump, yep, we want to add in uh, for our sphere. And it's our testing input system high jump function. And then when we test this and let it run. I mean, actually let's just make this a little bit simpler. Let's uh, make sure we can see when we're doing high jumps rather than normal jumps. So I'm hoping that we can do a high jump mid jump as well. Um, that all looks okay actually. I think. Just trying to think of systems where it wasn't, it wouldn't be able to reset the high jump when it hits the floor, but I think it will. Okay, so we just do a normal jump. Yeah, so high jump started. Jump, jump is performed. I don't know what the bottom window here is. Is that a console? No. Okay, so. If we tap the jump button, why is it not going to the bottom? There we go. Right, so when we tap the jump button, we get jump started, the jump formed, the jump actually happens, the high jump tries to start, uh, the jump is cancelled because we let go of the keyboard, uh, the space key, and then the high jump is cancelled because we let go of the space key but wasn't performed because we didn't hold it down long enough. Now we hold it. Ah, okay. Hmm. So if we hold it, we trigger the jump and also the high jump. So I think what's happening is if we get the jump performed, we get the normal jump off the ground and then the high jump performed kicks in. So it triggers the uh, hmm. yeah the the high jump form triggers that so triggers the the double jump. What's... Uh, so the double jump triggers. Uh, as a high jump. Okay, well, we're, we're learning things here. So, how would we make it so that if you hold the space bar, the jump isn't triggered? How about if we trigger this on the cancelled? So if you just tap it, then when you let go of space, it's, it's when it jumps. But if you hold it, 
after a few seconds, then it jumps. I know this is that's kind of a cheaty way around it, but I think that could work. Okay, and then we play. So if we just tap it, we still get our normal jump. But if we hold it, we get our super high jumps. And we might need to zoom out a bit so we can actually see this happening. <laughs> Right, let's uh, scale out a bit. I would quite like to make the ball bigger so we can see it easier. But I don't want to affect the the, uh, the midpoint is that 0 0.5. So, let's try it like that so we can see it. Oh wait, we need to move the camera, don't we? Uh, what? Well. Right, so we set the camera, we move out the camera to here, and then that, why did that stop there though? Why is it now hovering up in the air? Up at five, why is it at five? Ah, because it's got a sphere collider, hasn't it? Yeah, okay. This collider is resting. So I think just for the moment, what we're going to do I'm going to bring the sphere collider down to... Uh, a 0 0.5 radius is right though, isn't it? And white equals 0. Okay, let's just make this a bigger object then. Um, we'll put starting at five. Uh, okay, so this radius is something odd. So point five is not in meters. I think it's point five or the scale, maybe? Something like that? Okay, so then we're going to have to edit our code to be Y location 5. I wonder if this is how things like uh, Dump King are coded, so that it's it's jump on release rather than. Ah, okay. So now what we're doing is we're getting the high jump performed because that happens when we hold down the space key long enough, but when we let go of the space key it's triggering the normal jump as the double jump, so we swapped around. <laughs> um, so we need a feedback as well. So let, this is going to be the worst way to doing this, but uh, uh, forming high jump. And that is going to start off as false. Ooh. 
and again when we hit the ground we're going to set that to false again um no not there Not in the high jump one. Actually, uh, no, here it's going to go to true. And here it's going to go to true. And we need to say if uh, context got cancelled, then we said it's false. So if you go into any of these where it allows you to do the double jump, sets it to true. And when you let go of the space key, sets it to false. And only when it's false. And like that. What you do in most other languages. So let's hope that that works. Um, we don't need this line in though, because we're resetting it when we let go of space here. Okay, I think we might have that running. So we reset this. And now what we should have is we have our Let's have another look at what we're doing here. So we're saying when we jump, if it's, oh, and not performing high jump, what we want. Put that the wrong way around. Simple mistake. Okay, so there's our normal jump. And if we do a second jump in the air, we get our high jump. That's our double jump. Sorry, double jump, not high jump. But if we pull down, we get a higher jump. And when we let go, we can do a little jump in the air. We do a little jump and then a hold jump. So let's, let's just see we can get it just so that when we do the jump we don't want all these other messages so we just want this log here just to clear up the log a little bit so i think if we save that and reload it should quite clearly show us when we're doing each of the jumps and at what height we're doing those jumps Uh, I think we double clicked that there, so it's going to take us back, yeah. Give it a second. Right, so we have our normal jump. We have our normal jump with a double jump in the air. We have our high jump. Uh, we don't have our high jump. Oh, we don't have any jump now. Why do we not have any jump? Hmm. Uh, let's also add in Performing high jump. 
go and uh, double jump. Uh, and with the space in between. And that. Uh, and then this is high jump. And this is double jump. Do that instead. Let's see if we're we're running into one of those issues where one of the balls is setting in a situation where we don't want it to. We could try run through the code, but it's more fun doing it this way. Okay, so our normal jump. Double jump is true. High jump is false. That's correct. There's our normal jump. And there's our double jump. And then we try and do it here. Because double jump is false, we can't do our second jump. So now if we hold, we get our high jump. And then our normal jump. And our normal jump. Ah, our double jump is not reset. Of course. Right, where are we saying double jump available? True. So really what we want to do is I know it's gonna be messy code for a bit, but I'm just playing around here. So I'm just gonna put that into the normal jump cancel action. So before we even get through to it, if we're on the ground, then we show that our jump is available. So, uh, do we restart this? We have our normal jump. No. Okay, well, I think we'll come back to this. <laughs> <laughs> I've taken enough of a detour here. This is something that I'm going to be messing around with when I'm actually making a game. Um, and there'll be bug fixes and I'll have much neater code at that point. So I won't have all of these kind of if statements looping into themselves. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back to not having any of this set up really. Um, and what were we doing? We just had a hold play, right? That as we were pressing, we were getting over here the value of one. So on the start and perform, we've got a value of one, and then on cancel, we got a value of zero. Okay, yeah, so he was just testing the processor. hold button. So now as I click, and if there you go, now instead of plus one, we get minus one. So these processors apply some sort of processing on top of the actual event. This is going to be more useful as we get into the movement choice. Oh, wait, what? So that's interaction. Did we skip see, forward? Interactions are super useful for making some more complex actions. I know, and again, remember that everything that we're doing here 
we're making it work with the keyboard, but if we add another binding, it would also work with the gamepad or touch or anything else. Okay, and so... also, this is a list, so you can have multiple interactions. So you could have a hold, then a slow tap, and so on. Although, ideally, chances are you would make them into separate actions. Okay, so that's interactions, and then you've got the processors. Mm -hmm. Like I said, these aren't really very useful for buttons, but you can, for example, add an invert processor. And right now, before we hit play and clear the console, we can see that as we were pressing, we were getting over here the value of 1. So on the start and perform, we've got a value of 1, and then on cancel, we got a value of 0. Now if we add the invert processor, so now as I click, and if there you go, now instead of plus 1, we get minus 1. So these processors apply some sort of processing on top of the actual event. Okay. This is going to be more useful as we get into the movement joysticks, but we'll see that in a bit. Okay, so with this, we have covered the absolute basics. And we also saw how the built-in player input component works. But like I said previously, you also have the ability to generate a C-sharp class and have a lot more control over it. So let's go into the project window and over here select the actual input actions asset. Then you got a button to edit the asset which opens up this window and then you've got a toggle for the generate C-sharp class. So you can take this one and then you see all of these inputs. So if you want, you can modify what file they're going to be generated in, what class name, what namespace and so on. But here, just leave them as default and hit on apply. So as you do, you can see over here that it generated the C-sharp file. So over here, the player input actions. Now, if you want, you can open and inspect this. It just generates all kinds of functions, fields, and events based on the input action. So for example... Let's have a quick look at this. The assets, player input assets. Dot C -C dot CS. Okay, so this is code was also generated. Yeah, changes the file may cause incorrect behavior. So this is our input bindings that we saw previously here. So these ones all combined into our input. That's the input action asset. Yeah, okay. And then we're finding the player. Finding the actions jump and high jump. Okay, so this is more of the behind the scenes what's occurring. So you can have full control over uh, every part of this. I don't think we need to go into detail on that. For example, we define the player action map, and over here we can see the player action map right in here. And then for the player, we define some actions, so we define the jump action. So over here we can see an interface that implements the jump action, and over here the player actions. So all of this code is all dynamically generated, so we've got our jump action and the various events started, performed, and cancelled. So you really don't need to worry about how this script works, but if you want to, feel free to inspect it. So back in our testing input system, here in order to use that, we just need to create an instance of our generated c -sharp class. So it's called player input action, so new player input actions. So we just construct this object. And then on this one, we need to access the player action map. And then we're going to access the jump action. And finally, we're going to subscribe to the performed event. So just mm. plus equals and subscribe to this one. And there you go, the signature is exactly the same. So on jump performed, you've got a combat context. And then over here, you can do anything. So let's use this exact same function instead of creating a new one. So just like this, let's see if this works. And just up here, right now, we're no longer using the player input. So let's actually remove this component. So we're just going directly through the c -sharp class. So let's try. Here I am, and as I hit space, and nope, nothing happens. Now that is because we need to make sure to enable this input action. So by default, when you construct, it's actually disabled, so it's not actually listening to input. So in order to enable it, we actually have various ways we can do that. We can go directly into the player input actions and call enable. However, if you do it like this, it will actually enable all of the various action maps. So if you had one for the player, one for a vehicle, one for the UI, all of them would be active at once, which is probably not what you want to do. So instead of enabling the entire input actions asset, you can just go into the player. So just go into this action map and just enable just this one. Mm. And now here, if I hit space, yep, there you go, everything works. So I've got the performed action. Okay, I don't think we want to do that just yet. The rigid body upwards. And 
again note how here we only have one log. That is because since we're going through this one, we are only subscribing to the performed event. So if we wanted, of course, we could also subscribe to the started or the cancelled event. But since there, we just want the perform, so this is actually much better. Okay, with this working, now let's add some more actions. So on the input action asset, let's add another action. So we click on the plus button here. Let's name this one movement. And now here is the reason why there's a toggle for the autosave, which is because of the C sharp plus generation. If you have the generation enabled and you change this one tiny thing, so for example over here, change from button into value. As soon as I change, then you can see down there that Unity is compiling, so everything is frozen, I gotta wait a bit, and so on. So if you do have C sharp generation enabled, then it makes sense to disable it, do all your changes, then save, and when you save, then it does generate the C sharp file. Okay, okay, so this is our movement action. Then over here, so I think we don't need type. this. This is not a button, so we're going to use value. And then you can see a film for the control type. So this is if you want to limit it to a specific type, like for example, only allow the D-pad or analog Let's not have this on. anything. Or you can also go with any if you're not entirely sure. But in this case, we do know that we want movement, which means that we want an X and Y axis. So let's go with a simple vector here. And then let's also delete the default binding that was created automatically. So just right click over here, click on delete. And instead, let's click on this plus icon. Instead of adding a still, binding, okay. let's add a 2D vector composite. So with this, we get four directions. So up, down, left, right. So this makes it... Okay, let's just have a quick look at this. And then you can see a film for the control type. All right, so we go back into player input. We want a movement interaction. Movement action, even. And control type value, control type, vector two. And... So this is if you want to limit it to a specific type, like for example, only allow the D-pad or analog inputs or anything. Or you can also go with any if you're not entirely sure. But in this case, we do know that we want movement, which means that we want an X and Y axis. So let's go with a simple vector cube. And then let's also delete the default binding that was created automatically. So just right click over here, click on the button. And instead, let's click on this plus icon. Instead of adding a normal binding, let's add a 2D vector composite. Which I think so is this one. Get four directions. Yep. So up, down, left, right. So this makes it perfect for binding to something like the arrow keys or W, A, S, and D. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to do that. So just select this binding, then over here on the path, click on this one, click w. on listen. This one is up, so press on the W key. There you go, W. Then down, go over oh. here, press on S. Then left, let's go into A. And finally the right, let's go into D. All right, W, S, A, D. So again, don't forget, click on the save asset. So now it's going to regenerate the C sharp plus. And now once again, you can either go through the player input component. Oh, we can have auto save because we're not generating the class. So let's use that method since we're already using it here. So for that one, let's go into the player input actions. Then we're going to go into the player action map. And now the action is named movement. And let's subscribe to the performed event. Okay, so when that happens, let's just do a debug.log on the context. Okay, so let's test like this and see what the context contains. So here, and I'm going to press the W key, and yep, as soon as I do, you can see that happen. So you can see the context triggered on the player action map on the movement action, which has all of these bindings, so W, A, S, and D. This was a performed phase on this time, and if you look a bit further, you can see over here the value. We've got a value of 0.0, .0 and then 1.0. So I pressed on W, so that means I've got a 1 on the Y. Then if I press on the S, I've got 0 minus 1, if I press on A, I've got minus 1, 0, press on D, and I've got plus 1, 0. So we've got the perfect vector 2 in order to actually move our sphere. So let's use that to move our rigid body. So up here on the context, in order to read the actual value, let's go into context, and then you call the function read value, and this one takes a generic for the actual type. Here we have a two-dimensional array, so let's read it as a vector 2. And now in this case, this is the movement direction that we want to apply to the rigid body. Okay. Wait, he's going a little bit faster. Let me uh context read value x2. So we're making a new variable in here. Uh so x2 uh 
input vector. Now this might not be working because of I'm not using the C sharp components that he is. Input vector equals context dot read vector two. I think we've got to the end of that playlist, so let's put on some lo-fi. Okay, and then we're doing a float speed equals 5f Ooh. and we're saying sphere rigid body dot add force uh, new vector free input vector okay uh, so the x component of that, we want zero on the y direction and input vector dot y because it's the other part of our component on the z direction. And then force mode force. Okay, time speed okay, so and force mode force. Okay. So we're doing all that and we're times in that by speed. And force mode of force. And it's not a function. And we're missing a semi cut. You happy with that? I think we're happy. Do we save that? And then if we go back to our sphere, we look at our player input events player, movement, and add in our object as there, and our function is our testing input move. Now there's probably more to do, but let's just give that a try. I feel like that is, yeah, it's definitely moving, but because our object is so big, Right, uh, so what we want to do is reset our camera so we can see a bit closer. Probably like here. Um, and we can drop our object size down now. Uh, five, five, five. Actually, just let's go back down to one. And then our wire will be 0.5, so it sits on the right bit. And we'll move our main camera in here. That moved. I think that moved. Move a bit closer. Um, and in our input system, we're going to go back to some more normal values. So five and five for the normal jump, and maybe 10 and 10 for the high jump. I know that some of that is gonna be broken, but just for demonstration purposes. Okay, and then go back to here, let it load, let's play. Uh, let it load again. Okay, ooh. So it's not hold based, it's like uh, hat based. God, that's horrible. <laughs> um, right, so what we would want here is the interaction to be old, right? Uh, it should be based on the value. See if that does what I think it should do. Okay, that's much more, that's much easier to control. Oh, it doesn't help that our 
x and y is different from the view that we've got. So really, if we rotate around onto the xy axis, sorry, onto the z axis, but we want the back. There we go. Uh, and what we want to do is we want to focus on you, zoom out, uh, go up a bit, zoom out. Here, move our main camera here, and then play. Then it should be in the right orientation for the controls. Yep. It's still not really... Because yeah, if I just hold a direction, it doesn't actually provide that input. It, has, it only updates when the joystick's in a new position. And I think it might be a one-off input. Yeah, because it's adding force at the moment. We don't, we don't really want additive force. I don't think you really want it for space at all. That's really slow. I, I suppose it's more physics-based. You're providing a force input to it. You could make some quite horrendous uh, rage games out of this, I reckon. Like a... It's like sailing a ship. You have to put inputs in miles before your turns. Or like a hover, hover car. Not hover car, hover craft. You have to turn before you need to turn. <laughs> Okay. Quite interesting. We're doing contact out read valley, reading a vector two, so this is going to be our input vector. Then I'm just doing a sphere rigid body in order to add a force. Then for the force, I'm constructing a vector three because the sphere is in 3D and the input vector is in 2D. So just making that using the input vector X, then zero on the Y, since I don't want to move the sphere upwards, but rather back and forward. So just put that one, multiply it by a certain speed and so on. Okay, so let's test like this. So here I am, and as I press on W, and if there you go, it did move the sphere. However, you can see that it moved by a tiny amount, so now I press on S, and it goes backwards, and now I press on D, and it goes to the right, press on A, and so on. So the one thing that you do notice is that this input gets only triggered once, so it's essentially on a button press. So if I want to actually move the sphere, I've got to spam the buttons. Mm -hmm. That's not supposed to be like that. Ideally, for a movement input, it makes more sense to constantly check the current state and constantly apply it. So for that, we can go with another method. Instead of over here, subscribing to the performed on the movement action, we can make a very simple private void update. And over here, we can actually read the value on every frame. So we can go into player input actions. So that means that we need to make this as a member field. So we go into that one, access the player action map, access the movement action. And then over here we can call read value, read as a vector 2, and so on. So the same thing that we're doing here, let's do it up there. Okay, can we convert that into the way that we're using it though? Um, so we are doing a new private void. Uh, private void update. And within our update, we want to do our read value, which is this one. Uh, but we don't have our context now. But our context is input action, right? Dot callback context. Maybe? Nope. Let's see what options we get on input action. Just callback contact. Yeah, because it's not going to know what context is.
Mm. Right, I'm not too sure on that. But uh, I do want to go and have a quick break. Let's just put this over. Let's reset that. Um, and we're going to be back in. Uh, it's probably going to say 10 minutes, but I'll be back before then. Just going to have a quick drink and a little break from the screen. Um, little stretch, etc. So back in a sec. Right, bit of energy back and water stopped up. So let's have a little look where we got up to. So what we were looking at was, how are we going to map these all together? Um, So we were trying to do an update function on the move input without reverting to the C sharp script that uh, the guy's using in the controls. So how do we think that's gonna come through?
So we've hooked up our player move. I wonder if he's going to show. Okay, so the exact same thing, except on the update, we're going through the player input actions, player movement, and so on, and then applying the force, and everything should work. So now let's see. So now as I press and hold, and if there you go, now movement is indeed being applied on every frame. Let me just lower the speed. And since this is a rigid body, we should probably do this on fixed update. And if now in here, I can indeed use W, A, S, and D in order to actually move my sphere. So move it to the right, move it upwards, then start moving downwards, and so on. All right, so now it's working, and I'm reading the value on every single update. So chances are for movement, you want to go with this method instead of the event method. Okay, so now it's probably time to look into how multiple inputs like keyboards and keypads work. Over okay, um, what we're going to do is we're going to swap over uh, to the C sharp option, but not have it automatically generated as a separate file. Um, because I don't think we need that for the moment while we're doing this. So instead of invoking Unity events, we invoke C sharp events. And then when we go back to here, which I'm glad we didn't get rid of all of this. I'm going to bring that in. I'm going to bring that back in. We're going to bring in our dump control here. Um, we're going to get rid of... Uh, we're going to get rid of the high jump for the moment. And we might come back to that at some point. So we have our jump action and we want our void fixed update. Um, use our player input actions. Triggered. Our action on triggered. I think we want to take this one out for the moment. We can just collapse that code. Right, then we have our player input actions. Which is something new. Okay. So we want a new private player player input actions and that is called player input actions player input is get player input that's fine let's get rid of this line no not that one how you select a line. No, that's it's keyboard shortcut for it, isn't it? That's just actually that'll do. We'll do that for the moment. Okay, so then we want player input actions equals uh new player input actions. Mm, I feel like we're still doing something wrong here. Let's just have a quick look at Check the current state and constantly apply it. So for that, we can go with another method. Instead of over here, subscribing to the performed on the movement action, we can. So we've got our rigid body, we've got our player input, we've got the input actions. Get rid of you for the moment. Let's, uh, let's clear it down to being just what we, we're interacting with here. So on awake, we have our rigid body. We have our player input. These two are gone. We have our player input. We have our player input actions. New player input action. Yep, yeah, okay. Uh, 
And then player input actions dot uh, player dot uh, jump dot formed plus equals jump, which is our function below. It seems to be okay about. And then uh, again, player input actions dot move the player dot movement. Is it plus uh, subscribing to movement underscore formed? I think we are going to have to generate our uh, script file here in a second. We can make a very simple private void update. And over here, we can actually read the value on every frame. So we can go into player input actions. So that means that we need to make this as a member field. We've got, yeah. So you go into that one, access the player action map, access the movement action. And then over here, we can call read value, read as a vector two and so on. So the same thing that we're doing here. Let's do it up there. Value. As a vector two. Okay, so the exact same thing, except on the update, we're going through the player input actions, player movement, and so on, and then applying the force, and everything should work. Right, so then instead of this, we're saying this is equal to this. And then we're calling this. And we're getting rid of this completely. Most of the jump we want to ignore now. We're going back to the old. So if uh, context dot formed, then we do our jump. And that's all we're doing here now. And we're hiding all of this other bit that we were messing around with. Okay. Mm-hmm. So we have that, we have that. So why is it not liking? So now let's see. So now as I press and hold, any of there you go, no. So we want our speed a bit lower anyway. But why is it not liking actions here? So we'll save that for the moment. And I think what we want to do is we go here and we generate this class. Right, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, when we apply that, we get our player input actions here. And if we open this up, we should have our movement performed class somewhere here. Play movement, play movement. Right, so we've missed something here, haven't we? So you go into that one, access the player action map, access the movement action, and then over here we can call read value. Yeah, we've done all that. I think he's got to change. Why is he not? Okay, so the... Oh, he's not even using this movement performed function. I think if we take that out completely. He 
doesn't actually need that there. I'm I'm fairly certain. We let this build and then we play. Give it a second. Mm, not quite. So is he actually using that then? So what he's actually got here is a uh, private void uh, movement performed. Yep. And now it should be okay with that. Uh, and that is a function. No, not with that. That. And this function. Why is it still got an issue with that? Uh, it takes in input action dot by context as context now it's happy with it that's fine okay and then what we want to do is we want to just log dot our context and then he's doing everything here as well but with context rather than the other bit. So this instead is context.read value. Have a quick look behind the subtitles. Yeah, I think we're there. Exact same thing, except on the update, we're going through the player input actions, player movement, and so on, and then applying the force, and everything should work. So now let's see. So now it's Let's just double check that. So we save that, we go here, so it compile, and then we'll run. And then in the console, no, what are we doing wrong? Are we even, we are running aren't we? Hmm. Right, let's add in some logs so we can see where we're getting to. The logs is here, update. As I press and hold, and yep, there you go. Now movement is indeed being applied on every frame. Let me just lower the speed. And since this is a rigid body, we should probably do this on fixed update. And yep, now in here I can indeed use WASD in order to actually move my sphere. So, okay, so the exact same thing, except mm. on the update we're going through the indeed being applied on every frame. Let me just lower the speed. And since this is a rigid body, we should probably do this on fixed update. And yep, now in here I can indeed use WASD in order to actually move my sphere. So, move it to the right, move it upwards, then start moving downwards, and so on. Alright, so now it's working and I'm reading the value on every single update. So chances are for movement, you want to go with this method instead of the event method. Yeah, okay. So I was right, we didn't need this. Let's just comment it out for the moment. Uh... But we've probably got a typo somewhere, right? Input actor equals player input actions dot player dot movement dot read value back to two. Yep. Float speed at one or at one f in sphere, rigid body, add force, new vector three, the x and the z inputs, yeah. Turn spiral speed as force, yeah. This is not needed. And then our jump is if context performed, debug log jump, uh, which we don't need. Sphere the jump five impulse, that's fine.
Hmm. I feel like we've got the same file here. Right rigid body. Player input. Player input actions. There must have been a setup step that I missed. Right, so generated C sharp class. So it's called player input action. So new player input actions. So just construct this object. And then on this one, we need to access the player action map. And then we're going to access the jump action. And finally, we're going to subscribe to the performed event. So just plus equals and subscribe mm. to this one. And there you go, the signature is exactly the same. So on jump performed, you've got a combat context. And then over here, you can do anything. So let's use this exact same function instead of creating a new one. So just like this, let's see if this works. And just up here, right now, we're no longer using the player input. So let's actually remove this component. So we're just going directly through the C-sharp class. So let's try. Okay, Ram, and that's what we missed, and isn't it? Nothing happens. Now that is because we need to make sure to enable this. Right, where did we find well, previously you also C -sharp have class. the ability to generate a C-sharp class and have a lot more control over it. So let's go into the project window and over here select the actual input actions asset. Then you got a button to edit the asset which opens up this window and then you've got a toggle for the generate C-sharp class. So you can tick this one and then you see all of these inputs. So if you want you can modify what file they're going to be generated in, what class name, what namespace and so on. But here just leave them as default and hit on apply. So as you do, you can see over here that it generated the C sharp file. So over here mm -hmm. is player input actions. Now if you want, you can open and inspect this. It just generates all kinds of functions, fields, and events based on the input action. So for example, we define the player action map, and over here we can see the player action map right in here. And then for the player we define some actions, so we define the jump action. So over here we can see an interface that Oh this is why we don't want auto save on. Okay, so we'll have to remember to save. We just have the press button and the vector. That implements the jump action, over here the player actions. So all of this code is all dynamically generated. So we've got our jump action and the various events started, performed, and canceled. So you really don't need to worry about how this script works, but if you want to, feel free to inspect it. So back in our testing input system, here in order to use that, we just need to create an instance of our generated c -sharp class. So it's called player input actions, so new player input actions. So just construct this object. And then on this one, we need to access the player action map. And then we're going to access the jump action. And finally, we're going to subscribe to the performed event. So just plus equals. And okay, it might be that we want to take off the player input here. Let's remove this component. It might be conflicting. But we've got an update now. Puzzle object. So player input actions, it's new player input actions. We're declaring it up here on a wait. It's getting set up. Subscribe to this one. And there you go, the signature is exactly the same. So on jump performed, you've got a combat context. And then over here, you can do anything. So let's use this exact same function instead of creating a new one. So just like this, let's see if this works. And just up here, right now, we're no longer using the player input. So let's actually remove this component. So we're just going directly through the C-sharp class. So let's try. Here I am, and as I hit space, and nope, nothing happens. Now that is because we need to make sure to enable this input action. So by default, when you construct, it's actually disabled, so it's not actually... Ah, uh, that's input. what we're not doing. So in order to enable it, we actually have various ways we can do that. How did I miss that line? directly into the player input actions and call enable. 
However, if you do it like this, it will actually enable all of the various player action input, So you can have one for the player, one player, for the vehicle, one for the UI, enable. all of them will be active at once, which oh. is probably not what you want to do. So instead of enabling the entire input actions asset, no, you enable, can just go into it? the player. So just go into this action map and just enable just this one. Was that there in the here, if end? I hit space, yep, there you go, everything works. Did I miss it? So I've got the performed action and it triggered the jump and it jumped the rigid body upwards. And again, note how here we only have one log. That is because since we're going through this one, we are only subscribing to the performed event. So if we wanted, of course, we could also subscribe to the started or the canceled event. There we but go. Just want the perform, so this is actually much better. Okay, with this working, <laughs> now let's add some more actions. Okay, and then so another controller. The asset, let's add another action. So we click on the plus button here. Let's name this one movement. And now here is the reason why there's a toggle for the autosave, which is because of the C sharp plus generation. If you have the generation enabled and you change this one tiny thing, so for example over here, change from cool. value into value. As soon as I change, then you and can then see down there that you if we boost value, that a little so bit, that one F I think bit, is so a little. So you still more. have C sharp generation enabled, then it makes it five is a bit too much on this, changes, but save, let's give it a go. Generate the C -sharp plus. Okay, so this is our movement action. Then over here for the action type, this is not a button, so we're going to use value. And then you can see a field for the control type. So this is if you want to limit it to a specific type, like for example, only allow the D-pad or analog inputs or anything. Or you can also go That's with much any, more I'm not entirely sure. Reactive. But in this case, we do know that we want movement, which means that we want an X and Y axis. So let's go with a simple vector here. And then let's also delete the default binding that was created automatically. So just right click over here, click on delete. And instead, let's click on this plus icon. Instead of adding a normal binding, let's add a 2D vector composite. So with this, we get four directions. So up, down, left, right. So this makes it perfect for binding to something like the arrow keys or W, A, S, and D. Cool, cool, so I'm cool. going to do that, so just select this binding, then over here on the path, click on this one, click on listen, this one is up, so press on the W key, there you go, W, then down, go over here, press on S, then left, let's go into A, and finally the right, let's go into D. Alright, W, S, A, D. So again, don't forget, click on the save asset, so now it's going to regenerate the C sharp plus, and now once again, you can either go through the player input component, or access the C sharp plus directly. So let's use that method since we're already using it here. So for that one, let's go into the player input actions. Then we're going to go into the player action map. And now the action is named movement. And let's subscribe to the performed event. Okay, so when that happens, let's just do a debug.log on the context. Okay, okay we, got, the map we, got, the... we got through those bits. Let's skip forward a bit there. To add a force want to move the sphere upwards but rather back and forward you can see that it's moved by and it makes more sense to constantly check okay, I think we're on to the next chapter apply it. so for that we can go with another method instead of over here subscribing to the performed on the movement action we can make a very simple private void update and over here we can actually read the value on every frame so we can go into player input actions so that means that we need to make this as a member field. Okay, yeah, with that one as well. Okay, so now it's probably time to look into how multiple inputs like keyboards and gamepads work. Over here on the input action asset, if you go on the top left corner, over here you've got a button where you can add a bunch of control schemes. So let's add one. Let's call this the keyboard. And over here on the list, you select the type. So let's select the type keyboard and hit on save. Then here for each individual binding, you can go ahead and over here tick. And Right, so what does he do? Sorry, control he schemes. adds control so scheme. Let's add one. Let's call this the keyboard. And over here on the list, you select the type. So let's select the type keyboard and hit on save. Okay. So we're doing new keyboard and of type keyboard. Save. Then here for each individual binding, you can go ahead and over here tick and make sure that this one is used in the keyboard control scheme. So just select that one in there. Then over here for all of these, select them one by one. Okay, so now all of these bindings are set as keyboard bindings. And now we can go up here, create a new control scheme, name oh, each of these. Pad. And on the list, let's select a gamepad, select a generic gamepad, and just hit on save. And when you do, you can see that the bindings disappear. Okay, so now then you want, of course, that are not lost. So you add can a new go one. back into the keyboard and you can see the keyboard bindings. Gamepad. Then go into the gamepad and over here we're going to add gamepad. Then we bindings. add 
So generic. right now I just connected my mm -hmm. Xbox controller and you can also see over here on the logs that the input system automatically detected that that one was connected. So with this, let's do just like we so did. So rather than this, let's from this we're going to add we just want binding, button this binding, going to the south. Path and listen, and now I'm going to press a button on my Xbox and that's gamepad, and that's our gamepad. Button. However, if you try this, it might not be working. That is because I connected the gamepad right while the game was running. So to solve that, just make sure you save the asset and just play the scene. And then if you quit again, now it should be identified. So now I can go up here. So now it should still be working. A button, and there you go, it does connect. In order to validate that everything was connected, there's actually one that is super useful that I'm going to talk about in a bit. But just here briefly, you can go over here into Window, Analysis, Input Debugger, and over oh yeah, we had look at that already. To see your controller connect. All right, so our okay, so controller is in, on listen, click on the A button, and, and our keyboard here, you is working as well. Interesting thing about the input system: if you want, you can select the A button on the Xbox controller. So if you do that, then mm -hmm. this action will only be triggered by the Xbox A button. Meaning that pressing X on a PlayStation controller will not trigger this action. So the better approach you can take is just use this one, just button south gamepad. This yep. is a generic control that won't work on any gamepad. So you've got button south, north, east, and west. And with that, if you select this one, so button south gamepad, so the generic one, if you select this one, then it will trigger on an Xbox A button or on a PlayStation X button or on a Switch A button and anything else that has the standard inputs. Okay, so that's the simple button input, okay? And then over here for the movement, let's click on this button. And now for the keyboard, we made a 2D vector composite. That's because it was based on four buttons. But for the gamepad, we really just want to use a joystick. So let's use a normal binding. And then over here for the pad, I think we might have already on listen. done that. Now I'm going to move around the left stick. We're looking at it automatically actually, we want So once again, movement. you can go with the Xbox controller or yep. the more generic gamepad. All mm -hmm. right, so that's it. And now just with this, we can see the true power of the input system, which is we do not need to touch our code at all. The code is already set up to work with the jump action and the movement action, regardless of whatever physical input they come from. So just with this, if I click on save asset and I play the game, now I can, for example, press space on the keyboard in order to jump. And now without doing anything special, I'm just going to press the A button on my Xbox controller. And yep, there you go, it does trigger the jump, now using the mm. gamepad. So here, this is the example of the awesome power of the new input system. So it allows you to completely separate actions from the physical inputs. You write your code to work simply with actions, and then you set up the input action asset with how those actions are triggered. Let's try then this. Without doing anything else, your game now works perfectly with any right, input. We need to say so the player can seamlessly switch between the keyboard or gamepad and anything else, and everything works perfect. All right. And then awesome. if we play. Okay, so with that, you already know the basics, but let's see if uh, for example, like I said, the processors, they are super useful when it comes to gamepads. And by the way, here, since we actually have two control schemes, oh no, we'll do that after. we can add processors on the action itself. So click on the action and add a processor. This will apply to the action regardless of whatever control scheme you're using. Or you can just add the processor directly on the actual binding. So this is useful if you want to apply a processor to the gamepad, but not on the keyboard. So then over here, one of the more useful ones is over here, the stick dead zone. This helps when gamepads have slight issues and they aren't perfectly on 0-0. So for example, you've heard of the Nintendo Joy-Con Drift. That is where the actual physical joystick gets slightly moved to the side, never actually goes out to 0-0. So that is why you have the stick dead zone. So with this processor, what it does is if you move the stick by less than this amount, then it won't be considered 0, so it won't do anything. And if you move it by more than this amount, then it won't be considered 1. And also the value between these two is normalized. So for example, if I take away this one and I put the minimum at 0.5, so now it should only read a value of more than zero after I move the stick more than halfwards towards any direction. So over here, I am physically moving the stick and as you can see, nothing on the console, so it's not listening. And once I get past the halfway point, so just a bit more, and there you go, it does start to actually move. Okay. Let's set a log so we can see the actual values. So here, let's do a debug.log on the input vector to see what this says. So over there, it's all at zero, and as I move a bit, and it's still at zero, and only once I go past 0.5, then it actually reads the value 0.1. So like I said, this is normalized. So as soon as I move past the half, now it starts reading the value. And if I go way past to the side, so if I go past the 0.975, then it reads as an actual one. 
So that's what the processors do. As you can see, adding the stick dead zones to gamepad 6 is something you should always do so your players can play the game even if their gamepad isn't in perfect condition. And just as another quick example, that's good tonight, example, yeah. you've got the normalized vector 2. So as you saw, if I move the stick by a tiny bit, then it only shows like 0.1. But if I add the normalized, and now as I move just one tiny bit, you can see the values are normalized. So even if I move just a tiny bit, the magnitude of the actual input vector always goes up to a magnitude of 1. Okay, so now it's time to talk about the thing that I mentioned a while ago, which is for the input action, you've got value button and then pass through. Now pass through is similar to value, but it bypasses something called the disambiguation, which is the process through which the input system decides which input is active. Now, like I said, the input system handles all the complex logic when you have multiple inputs connected, like for example, multiple gamepads. And when using value, it will only trigger the action for the active gamepad, whereas on pass-through, it will trigger the action for every single gamepad. So now I also have a PlayStation controller connected, and if I move one, you can see on the log that it does change, but then it goes back into zero and so on. That is because right now it is receiving input from multiple controllers. So I'm just moving one controller and not the other one, and the input, as you can see, is very erratic. So the issue is because receiving input from all of the various controllers. So for example, one of them is telling them to go right, the other one left, and so on. So the whole thing gets all messed up. Whereas if I set this back into value, and over here, if I'm moving using the Xbox controller, yep, now the log is actually correct, so it's only listening to input from the Xbox controller. And now if I instead start moving the PlayStation controller, now it's listening to input from that one. So now it only listens to once at a time. So only the one that is active gets listened, all the okay. other ones get essentially ignored. That's if you want like so a local co-op mode. For if for some reason you want to read input from every device at once, but for the most part you really want to use value. Now so far we've been playing with an input action that we created from scratch. However, if you want to quickly get it up and running, you can also use the default. So if you go onto a game object and then add the player input component, if you do not assign anything here and instead you click on this button, then it asks you for a path, so you can save it, and it... Alright, let's do this. Okay, so, save that for the moment. We go here. Alright, give it a second. We got our sphere. And we want to add... Our input. Player input. Uh, and then we leave it as none. We just create actions, and we save that. It automatically creates the default input actions asset. So this one is pre-filled with a bunch of action maps and a whole bunch of actions. So if you want, you can use this as a starting point instead of building your own from scratch. Or you can just look at this one to inspect and see how they implemented things. So this one has got Move, all kinds of control species, a few action maps, all kinds of actions, and so on. And the UI. Now, on the lecture where I cover the differences between the input manager and the input system, I said That's that the input point. manager is just more simple and more compact in general. While that is true, the input system can also be very compact if you want it. So for example, just testing for a simple mouse click, you can do a private void update, and on update, you can do go inside the mouse, access the current active mouse, go into the left button, and then check was press this frame. If so, then with this you've got a simple test testing if the mouse is pressed. Then you can also test for specific gamepads, so you access the gamepad class, you access the current one, then you can access all the various buttons, so A, B, button north, south, and so on. You can also go into the keyboard and access the current and access, for example, the T key and so on. But do remember that this super compact method is something you should really only use for a very quick test or prototyping something new. Mm. When building something more permanent, you should absolutely be using the actions and not be working directly with specific buttons at yeah, all. Then also one thing here in the code you is don't, in regards to multiple actions. If you do this directly for so as an example, specific inputs, then you're works. preventing the so player from being able to customize their inputs. Map, let's say this is the UI. So we want a bunch of inputs for navigating through our UI. And up here, let's just add a single action, so just submit, so just clicking a button. And then for the binding, let's just bind it directly into the spacebar. So since it's bound to the spacebar, which also on the player, it's also bound to the spacebar. So the player has got to jump to the spacebar, 
and the UI has a spacebar doing a submit. Now how do you tell which action map should be active? If you're using the player input action, first of all let's make a function for the actual UI submit. So over here you've got the various action maps, so you expand upon this and set it. So here let's just copy this one, do the same thing. Except this one, call it submit. Okay, and now here let's just hook onto that event. Okay, so we got both events, both of them triggered by the same physical button, but they are on different action maps. So over here on the player input itself, you can see the default map, so this is the starting one. So do you start on the player or the UI or so on? And now how you change them is over here through code, you've got the player input, so you get the component and so on. And then you trigger the function switch current action map. You do that and then you pass in the map name or the ID. So let's use this super compact testing that I mentioned previously. And instead of the mouse, let's go with the keyboard. So if I press the T key, we're going to swap the player input to the action map UI, and if I press okay. the Y key, we're going to swap it back into the player action map. And then by pressing space, we should see either this function or this function. So let's see. Okay, so here I am, and as I press space, and yep, it's firing the jump action on the player action map. And now then. I press T to swap out the actual default map, and I press space again, and yep, now it's instead firing the submit action. And I press nice. Y to go back so this to is for like pause menus or... So interaction menus or trigger, the main menus that kind of stuff so for example if you had a ui that was only meant for the pause button then when the player hit on pause then you would call this and when the player hit on resume you would go with this one so this is when working with the player input built-in component and when working with c sharp plus very simple like we saw it only works if we actually enable it so on that one we would enable the player by default then when we want to switch we would disable the player so just go into the player, call disable, and then go into player input actions, access the UI and call enable. So if you went with the C sharp method, then this is what you would do. Now okay. something that I showed a while ago that is super useful is the input debugger. You go up here into window, then down here into analysis and open up the input debugger. And over here it shows you all of the various connected devices. Hmm. So for example, in my case, I've got a mouse, keyboard, I've got a dual shot. Hi Runa, how's it going? Then you can also see, for example, some unsupported devices. So for example, I recognize my microphone, but of course it's not a actual gamepad. Then I also recognize a bunch more. And my specific mouse isn't being recognized, but it is on the generic mouse. And then you can also double click on each of these to go even further. So for example, double click over here on the Xbox controller. Now, for example, if I press the A button, yep, you can see over there on the logs that it does recognize. So that's how you can now test it, yeah, that's fine. Zero. So you can see up here on the value, the actual Yep, the value going. Yeah. Input system working. One thing that is required in pretty much every game is rebinding keys. Yep. So let's see how that's done. Over here on the testing script, let's try rebinding the player jump action. So to do that, we access the same jump action. And then we call the function perform interactive rebinding. So this will essentially do what we saw pressing the listen button. Okay, so, so you call this, this creates a specific object. Play input and then you can action, start actually player. start listening. So what Jump. you do, then listen to the next input and assigns that to this um. action. However, just like this, we're going to get an error, but let's see it. And yep, there's the error. We cannot rebind something while something is currently enabled. So over here, we're right, going to go back here. So player dot jump. Oh, we got an extra dot as well. So jump dot form interactive. Is it there? Interactive rebinding. Uh, dot start. To this action. However, just like this, we're going to get an error, but let's see it. And yep, there's the error. We cannot rebind something while something is currently enabled. So over here, we are enabling the player action map. So when we go to rebind, we need to make sure to disable. So first we disable, and then we start actually rebinding. 
So like I mentioned a while ago, we create the various action maps. So for example, one would be for the player in-game actions, and then another one for the Hit UI disable, inputs. Do and that. then while the UI input actions was enabled, then you could easily rebind the player input actions. Now enable. this function, this one, the perform interactive rebinding, this actually returns an object of type rebinding operation. This object is what actually contains all of the data regarding the rebind. And then you can also add all kinds of modifiers in order to do various things before you actually call start. Specifically, it has an on-complete event. So we can hook into this one in order to listen when the actual rebind completes. So for that, we perform the interactive rebinding. Then instead of calling start right away, let's first call on complete. And on complete, this takes an action. So this one takes a callback as a parameter. So we can do it like this. So just a simple lambda expression. Uh, no, Cuphead today, unfortunately. <laughs> it's going to be, uh, yeah, ne next Monday, the next time. Um, got, got, to get, uh, got to get some Unity done so we can start programming, like, start making our own games. I have got a, a DVD stream later, um, but that will be about midnight. Uh, when the shrine resets. Mm, right, so dot on complete and that has a callback and we're finding that to a debug log on the combat. Okay, now let's play the game. And that function was triggered on awake, so right now it is listening for a button. So as I press, for example, the T key, there you go, it actually worked, it rebound the key, but we also function this one, the perform interactive rebinding. This actually works mm. in order to do various from the interactive rebinding, then instead of oh, really? start right away, let's first call on Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> and on complete, this takes an action. So this one takes a callback as a parameter, so we can do it like this. So just a simple lambda expression. And in here, let's just do a debug log on the callback. Okay, now let's play the game. And that. Okay, uh, so rather than the rebind, we want to see what the callback is. How's your day been? You had any more uh, reindeer intruders? function was triggered on awake, so right now it is listening for a button. So as I press, for example, the T key, there you go, it actually worked, it rebound the key, but we also see an interesting error related to a native collection that was not disposed of. That is because you must manually dispose of this object in order to avoid any memory leaks. So the object is the actual rebinding operation. So that's the same one that we get over here on the callback. So on complete, we do this and then we can call dispose. So we dispose that, okay. and after the rebind completes, let's re-enable the action map so we try it out. Dispose. So re-enable this one, and then let's see. Okay, so now it's listening to input, so as I press the T key, yep, now it should have rebound the jump action onto the T action. Okay, let's give this a try. It's just going to compile those changes. And when we run this, and check the console. So we press M. Why are we still getting all the update logs? Let's pause that a second. Uh, where is our update here? Get rid of that. Now it's not doing anything. And now T is our jump button. Okay. That's not too difficult. So perform interactive rebinding, uncomplete, dispose of it, and start. And then we re-enable. Okay. 
five minutes left for this tutorial. <laughs> so a video that's 45 minutes long has taken us uh, three and a half hours to, to get through. So for example, you can add a cancelling button, or you can limit the expected control type, or for example, you can limit some controls. So for example, you do with controls excluding, and then let's say excluding the mouse. Meows. So with this, I won't be able to rebind this action onto the mouse. So if I'm here and I click with the mouse, then nope, it's not rebinding because the mouse is not accepted. But if I press a different key on the keyboard, yep, there you go, now it doesn't rebind. So with that, we can now rebind our actions. So no I rebound way. this to the T key, so as I press T, it actually jumps. Okay, great. However, now if I stop playing the game and okay, I start so it's on the again, and I press the T key, and nope, it's not jumping, it's once again back to the default, back to the space. So naturally, we need to actually save the rebinds. And for that, there's actually two ways, depending on what version you're using. Now, if you're using version 1.0, then you need to manually save them. But if you're using version 1.1, then there's a much easier process. So when you actually rebind, so after the on complete, it actually changes one thing in the asset. So for example, over here on the comeback, you can access the action. And then for each action, you've got various bindings. So you can cycle through this one, or in this case, we just have one. So just zero for testing. And then for each binding, you've got a field for the override path. So let's look at what this logs. And as I press the T key to rebind, there you go, it did rebind in order to the keyboard T. So if you're using version 1.0, then this is what you need, not. you need to do. You need to go through your input actions, go through all the act. Right, so jump form, rebind. And we're looking at callback.action dot findings. And the first of that override path. Save it and see what we can what comes up in the console. Left button, yep. Okay. Action maps cycle through all the bindings for each action and save up the override path. However, if you're using version 1.1, then there is now a function to return some JSON for all of the overrides. So you just call this function and it returns a JSON string, which you can then easily save in a file or the player prefs or anything and then another function for actual loading them. So depending on your version, you've got two different methods. Okay, so the last thing we need to cover are the touch controls. You can define the bindings like- Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so for example, if you look on the input actions that are created by default- It's all right, you get, you get a stream every week. Look out, pet. <laughs> and that one, you can see that it does have the very specific touch controls. So you can do this to set up the individual bindings. But beyond that, there's also a super useful built-in component. So here, let me make a canvas. And then inside the canvas, let me make an empty game object. And now inside, I'm going to add a UI image. And for the image, I'm going to select a basic circle. And I'll just take the stick and let's put it over here on the corner. And now on the image itself, we can add a component and search for on-screen stick, this one. Then it's got two fields. So the movement range, that's how much this image is going to move relative to the parent. And then the control path, which is what this stick will simulate. So in this case, we can click on this. Let's go into the gamepad and we're going to simulate the left stick. So if we pull and return let's, the let's just have a quick look at this again. Screen, which you can then easily save in a file. So we come back into here. Or anything. And then another function. Come back into the project load. folder. So depending on your version, you've got two different methods. Okay, so the last thing we need to cover are the touch controls. You can define the bindings like any other. So for example, if you look on the input actions that are created by default, on this one for the control schemes, you can see it does have a touch control scheme. And that one, you can see that it does have the very specific touch controls. So you can do this to set up the individual bindings. But beyond that, there's also a super useful built-in component. So here, let me- Does it have the touch controls? Canvas. I don't know if touch controls on this one. 
next to Sarah to default on this one. Oh, it's got different control schemes here. Okay, there is. Yeah. Let me look. Okay. And for the control schemes, you can see it does have a touch control scheme. And that one, you can see that it does have the very specific touch controls. So you can do this to set up the individual bindings. But beyond that, there's also a super useful built-in component. So here, let me make a canvas. And then inside the canvas, let me make an empty game object. And now inside, I'm going to add a UI image. This. For the image, I'm going to select a basic circle. And empty and game just take object. And let's put it over here on the corner. Wait, just a quick look. And now inside, and then inside the canvas, let me make an empty game object. So you just called that. Okay. And now inside, I'm going to add a UI image. And for the image, Right, UI image. Okay, so this is, we're going to rename Dick. And then inside this, we have a UI object image. And this image. I'm going to select a basic circle. And I'll just take. This image. We just want a basic circle. Uh, I swear there's more than these ones. Where's he getting his uh, images let's from? And let's put it over here on. And now inside, I'm going to and add a UI, UI image. image. And for the image, I'm going to select a basic. Yeah, he just did it on there. Hmm. Which we don't have access to the basic input, do we? All right. Uh, maybe in here. So what do we want? We want a basic circle somewhere. Buttons. I think we just need another asset pack for for that to be honest. So for the time being, let's just use one of these. We just use one. And now just take the stick and let's put it over here on the corner. And now on the image itself, we can add a component and search for on screen stick. This one. Then it's got two fields. So right. uh, I'm gonna move this across to the bottom corner. No, move. Which should be movable by this right. No. Is this what we want? I think we want to move the canvas, right? No, we can't move the canvas. Can we move the stick? Maybe not. Uh, oh, it's off there. The canvas let me make an empty game object. And now just take the stick and let's put it over here on the corner. And now on the image itself. Okay, so he's left the middle bit, that's fine. Let's over here. We can add a component and search for on screen stick. This one. Then it's got two fields. So the movement range, that's how much this image is going to move relative to the parent. And then the control path, which is what this stick will simulate. So in this case, we can click on this. Let's go into the gamepad and we're going to simulate the left stick. So if we play, now as I click and drag the virtual joystick, and yep, there you go, it is indeed moving the sphere. 
so it's moving in any direction this stick will simulate so this so this one put this in. then it's got two fields so the movement range that's how much this image is going to move relative to the parent and then the control path which is what this stick will simulate so in this case we can click on this let's go into the gamepad and we're going to simulate the let stick so if we play okay let me just play And then, uh, now as I click and drag the virtual joystick, and yep, there you go, it is indeed moving the sphere. So it's moving in any direction, and not if I quite to the edge, and it's the 50 units that we saw there. So just like this, it is automatically working. And then the other built in component, let's make another image, put it on the other side, and this one is the on screen button. So this one, same thing, is just acts like a button. So let's pretend that this one is the gamepad south button. So as I click on this one, yep, it's simulating a jump. So for mobile, you can build your own UI from scratch. Okay, I think that's because... Let's try and reset that uh, button again. So what we want to do is... We're just going to clear that out for the moment. adding another image on here uh, UI image going in this corner and we're going to do on screen button and that's our gamepad button south Trying to use input. Hey, right. Because this is using the old input system, not both. So if we go here, edit preferences, not preferences, edit uh, settings, input system, no player. This one, use both. Okay, save this. Let's let it restart. And see if that then works. Might take a little while to restart here. Didn't be too long now. Okay, I think we're back. So if we now look at our canvas, why are these off the canvas? And why are we not seeing our sphere? Oh, because it's on the floor, right. Where is our main camera? Does the canvas just apply over the main camera? Okay, yeah. And we have our control. Now the question is, if we're up in the air, can we also move, yeah. There's full control over the direction in the air and uh, on the floor at the same time. That's quite cool. And attach the so that's how we do. Bindings, or you can use the super awesome, super useful built-in components in order to simulate a gamepad using touch and everything else in your game will work seamlessly. All right, so that's a new input system package. This was a pretty nice. big lecture since it's a pretty complex system, but hopefully oh, you can see how the complexity does pay off. Other YouTube channel. This system forces you to simulate you know, your logic and this. extract actions away from physical inputs, which in turn leads to writing better, cleaner code and a game that can be played on any input device. Go watch the Input Manager versus Input System Lecture if you haven't seen it yet in order to understand the differences, but if you're working on a proper game then this system is awesome and it's definitely what you should be using.
All right, so this was a lecture from my Ultimate Unity Overview course. Nice. There's lots more explaining tons of things well, like shape graph, assembly definitions, pretty good. Code builder, the video player, and so on. Go ahead and get the full course and learn how to master all of the Unity tools and features to help you make better games faster. All right, hope that's useful. Check out these videos to learn some more. Thanks to these awesome Patreon supporters for making these videos possible. Thank you, Code Monkey. And I'll see you next time. That was a very useful tutorial. Got a much better understanding of how player controls work. Um, what we'll do is we'll pop that off screen now. Um, and transition across. So, uh, yeah, very useful um, tutorial over how to do player controls. Uh, we played around quite a bit with some of the double jumping and high jumping options and broke various bits of it. But I think I've got a better idea of how it all fits together. Um, I think tomorrow when we have a look we're going to try and do uh next steps on mm, do we just go straight into the next one we might do this i think this uh other tutorial that we saw this endless runner from practical programming i think what we'll do is we'll go straight into this and wherever he use uh, he uses the old method of player input we're going to try our best to convert that into C sharp scripts and use the new package system. Um, hopefully, we can get a a template infinite runner set up, and then we'll look at adding in different features, different power ups, that kind of stuff, and just playing around and seeing what we can do. Um, yeah, I think it's been. Quite productive day, quite productive stream. Um, I hope anyone who's been lurking or watching or chatting has enjoyed it. Uh, planning to be back on uh, just after midnight, actually just before midnight, which is in about just over six hours time. Uh, for a, it's probably going to be a short DVD stream, uh, looking at what's new in the shrine and trying to build some uh yeah trying to create some perk builds based around what perks are available in the shrine so it could be quite fun who knows depends what uh perks we get really but there, there, there's possibilities around it um so yeah if that sounds something you might enjoy then hopefully see you later and thanks everyone for joining in the stream Hope you have a good afternoon or evening now. See you later.